this all started, I believe, on the New Year's episode when it was revealed that myself, James, one of the three carpool critics at this table, there's more, said that Interstellar was overrated. <gasps> wow. I said, get at me, haters. Sacrilege. They got at you. And get, get at me, you did. They did. <laughs> Interstellar has since become the most requested podcast. Uh, Colton, who I can actually see through a window right now. Oh, God, he's looking over here. Colton, he's oh, playing he's, the soundtrack on his phone. He says it's the best soundtrack ever. It's his favorite movie of all time. It's a lot of people's favorite movie of all oh, time. That's fantastic. So we watched it. David came over on Friday. Mm. Uh, we ate a lot of lasagna. I watched it by myself in seclusion. Mm, sorry. Well, we I, I didn't. Did you start watching it at 11 p.m.? Because that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, what the heck? What, what, no. what were you doing before then? Having a good old time. Well, that's fun. So the question is, was my mind changed? Riley, so we're just here. We're just here to like. This podcast is about me, okay? <laughs> James, the podcast. Wait, who at this table had seen Interstellar before? We've all seen it. I haven't seen you it. You never saw it before. It Sorry, time. what? Yeah, I've been saving it. I knew. I thought I was gonna have like a spiritual thought, moment watching it. I thought like it was gonna be a life changing movie for sure. So I was just saving it, and it built up and became this like oh, monolithic figure no. in my life. And remember, he well, owned it. He owned I a owned copy. It. It's yeah, a digital copy, but he actually owned a Blu-ray. I feel like that's kind of a spoiler for how you feel about this. No, no you're not. Uh, okay, Riley. What? You saw this movie how many times before? This is was I think this was only the second time I saw it. Usually like the 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 rule is that I only see a movie once. You're weird like that. Uh the first time you saw it was Except in for the, the classic the Star theater? Wars, Lord of the Rings, all that, you know. Yeah, I think I did see it in the theater. Yep. Okay. And okay. I really liked it. I thought it was like uh maybe a little worse than Inception, but like still very good. That's how I thought about it. And after your second viewing, lay it on us. What's your score out of 10? I liked it better the second time. I think I was kind of like, oh, why didn't I watch this again? Because I feel like it is one of those movies where there's like there's uh, depth to it. Anyways, okay, so my rating is 8 out of 10. My slogan is, it's like Inception. In space! In space. In space. In space. In space. Oh, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> that, added, that added so much. So wait a second. When you watch this the first time in the theaters in 2014... You were like twenty four years old. Uh, <laughs> I'm bad at Six math. Six years ago, you're thirty now. Thirty one. Oh, geez. yeah, kill me, right? Yikes. I'm this close to the grave. <laughs> David, you're a lot younger. Uh, what do you give this movie out of ten? I give it an eight point two. Chris Nolan, you're great, but it's time to take acid, buddy. Oh, what? interesting, interesting. Okay. You just wanted this to be two thousand one, a space odyssey. I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did. I watched it for the second time. And uh, I have to say, the, my younger self when I watched it in the theater was just stupid. I must have been hungry or something. This movie is sick. It was so sick. <laughs> hey, I there love he it. is. I love it, guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm also giving it the same rating I gave Inception, which I believe was nine. Yep. Oh, wow. This movie okay. is about as good as a Hollywood movie can get. Nice. It was, it was great. I loved it. I gave Inception an eight also, and I'm giving this an eight. So... I we just, know that already. Yeah. Okay. My wife, who was sitting just, beside me and usually falls asleep and stuff, was like, yeah. I forgot how good this is. I forgot, yeah, what, really I forgot what Riley gave so, Inception. So that's my... I think it's yeah. an eight. So that's my, <laughs> my slogan for the movie is uh, Interstellar, the best litmus test of whether or not someone's marriage material. <laughs> I don't understand. If what? you don't like this movie, you're not marrying me. There's Get too, out. There's too many levels there. Like Inception. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay, wait, it's not quite like Inception in Space, I guess, eh? No. Not at all. What are you <laughs> talking about? I mean, <laughs> in terms of the quality of the movie. I think this movie, in terms of like its characters and its plot, is way better than Inception. I think it succeeds at like attaching you to Matthew McConaughey and like really getting you like caring about what he cares about. You're right. R like in a huge way. And he's like awesome. The whole way you're rooting for him. It's definitely better in character. You make yeah. a hell of an argument, but David. Before I'm we get an 8.5. Oh, he's upgrading. <laughs> but before we go any further... Let's give you guys the synopsis. And by the way, this is a spoiler podcast. The spoilers are on, starting now. Spoilers. Interstellar is a space epic following a group of humans who are trying to save the human race from a shriveling, climate changey Earth. To do this, the team from NASA has two plans. Plan A is to launch a giant space station or many space stations from Earth with as many humans on them as possible, basically saving everyone. And if that doesn't work, plan B is to send a few people to Earth-like planets where they will Adam and Eve it until there's lots of new humans. 
And by the way, these Earth-like planets are accessible via a mysterious wormhole that appears to have been placed by benevolent and mysterious the, aliens. The bulk beings. Yeah, I didn't understand what they meant by bulk beings. I had to look that up. I watched it. I watched it with subtitles this time. Is that the synopsis? That's the synopsis, baby. And then stuff happens after that. Well, they go. Yeah. That will, and we'll then the talk movie happens. All that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bulk beings. I watched it with subtitles because I was like, "All right, I've already seen this movie, so I've gotten kind of the pure experience. So now I want to be like more analytical. So I want to like catch the little lines that I like missed the first time and stuff. And yeah, that was something that I did not pick up on at all the first time was the fact that they're they're like these beings are from a higher dimension. We call it the bulk, and so they call them bulk beings. Oh, they actually said that we call it the bulk. Yeah, in the movie? yeah, yeah. I was reading about that. I, I think it has to do with um. <laughs> either a Carl Sagan thing or it's this from this guy Kip Thorne who's a lot of people know that this movie was made in partnership with some actual physicists they had experts yeah Kip Thorne is the expert he's he's a physicist he's an expert in gravity and gravitational waves and he was like a producer executive producer on the show right so he was there from the beginning and he actually made like a supplemental book to go with the movie the the Mm -hmm. physics of interstellar and he says in that book um he uses this terminology bulk beings versus 2d brain beings. oh okay so have you ever have you ever watched those carl sagan videos were from his show the original imagine the original cosmos a vast cosmos yes cosmos before yeah. N- N- neil degrasse tyson days mm-hmm. there's an old series and one of the episodes that i love watching on youtube is him explaining the fourth dimension and he talks about okay we can't imagine the fourth dimension so but we can't imagine we can imagine dimensions two and three so if you imagine uh, you're a two-dimensional being, yep. which Carl Sagan called Flatlanders. You're like an ant, and your whole world is a piece of paper. Or you're like Mario in a 2D side-scrolling video game. Mm. Like, if you're an ant, right, and you can only look left and right and walk forward and back, and then a three-dimensional being, like a sphere, descended from the heavens, even though you don't have a Z-direction, and, and came into your uh, field of view, yeah. you wouldn't see a sphere. The sphere is three-dimension and you can't e- three-dimensional, and you can't even comprehend that. What you would see is a cross-section of this sphere as it passed through your field of vision. Which is? What? A circle. Well, first it would be a dot, and then... Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it would just expand out to a wider circle when you got to the full diameter of the sphere, and then it would collapse again into being a dot. So I guess the idea in this movie, when you get to the end, by the way, like you've got five-dimensional beings who are trying to show humans the fourth dimension. So Matthew McConaughey is trying to like visualize time as a spatial dimension, but we'll get to the ending later. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I loved seeing that um, that idea, the kind of like flatland, higher dimension, how that how like higher dimensional objects would uh, appear to us uh, visualized in this film, because I think that's a big thing about what uh, that that Kip Thorne helped with as well is helping to visualize the the wormhole and the black hole, which would be like, okay. The, the the black the wormhole is kind of the same thing, but the black hole is essentially when you think about a hole, it's a it's like a circle, right? And then it goes down, and and you know things fall in there. But what does a three dimensional hole look like? It can't just be a two D circle; it has to be a three D circle, which is a sphere, but so, a black one. But a black one. Yeah, so Kip Thorne yeah. did help them visualize the wormhole and the black hole, but mm-hmm. I don't believe he had any real input on how they built the Tesseract at the end, which is the oh, yeah. 4D representation of, of time. For that, it's it's really just up to their imaginations. Yeah. And I watched a featurette of how of like the set design for it. Apparently, it was like one of the first little models they built, and then they just left it the whole for the whole shoot because they're like, we don't know what to do. <laughs> you know when you did, it was like work avoidance like I don't know. I was definitely by the time you get that to that point in the movie you're just kind of like whoa cool like I don't, I don't think I was really trying to like break that down about how that worked. Hmm. Like okay it's just supposed to be beyond our comprehension. See, it's just a bunch of crazy stuff. I think my biggest problem with this movie is kind of exemplified in that scene when he's inside this tesseract. It's a beautiful visual and I think like it's really cool like how they stretch out the book so that it can create this complex shape. But really, he's just inside like a 3D file cabinet. And it's one of those things I feel like it, this movie mm. suffers from not actually expanding my imagination. It's not a movie that like pushes my, my, my view of like what things can be, what space can be, my understanding of space. Or like pushes me to ask questions where I'm like, whoa. This is, movie is very concerned with keeping things grounded and presentable to even the simplest of people. And I think yeah. it's So you both, want a fetus in the sky. I want like space fetus <laughs> times 10, man. I mean... Falling into a black hole and not 
uh, being annihilated is kind of trippy enough. Sort of. I feel like the fact that he falls into it, like, what's beyond the horizon of the black hole? No one knows. It's like, okay, but we have a pretty good idea. You just die because ridiculous forces tear you apart. Okay, but I, okay, so that in that scene, he gets a view of different time because he's traveling outside of just three dimensions. He's when traveling he's in through, the Tesseract. When he's inside the Tesseract. And so I think that there's a missed opportunity in this movie to be a little more surreal in general. If Matthew McConaughey has constantly been present throughout this whole movie, throughout this Tesseract, why aren't we seeing this movie a little bit more out of order? Why are they presenting it to us in a very linear fashion? If this movie, the climax, is this out of time moment, I think it's just a missed opportunity where like they could have made this thing like so much cooler. It's cool and like it looks mm. so cool. And when it, when it's collapsing in on itself, it's like an incredible visual. Like wow, yeah. no one's really good at visuals, but it just didn't like pushed my boundary of understanding like dimensions or like it like even as like Carl Sagan narrating what the fourth or fifth dimension would be like is more mind expanding than this movie to mm. me. I think I agree with you about Nolan's tendency to kind of have these ridiculous concepts grounded. Actually, this is one of the first notes I wrote while I was writing it. I'm like, Nolan is pretty good at taking ludicrously ridiculous propositions and making them seem kind of reasonable. Yeah. Like Oh, okay. There's bulk beings who, are like, you know, humans in the future who have gotten <laughs> such advanced technology that they ascend to higher planes of existence and are now going back in time to give us a wormhole. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, the, yeah. and the way that they, that's just like, I think I wrote that in the scene where um, uh, uh, Cooper and Murph find NASA with the coordinates or whatever, and they yeah. they come in there and they're like, okay, wait, where are you? And they're explaining the whole thing, and they're like what was it, 12 years ago or something? We detected this anomaly out by Saturn. And he's like, is that a wormhole? It's like, <laughs> what, do you, what? what do you mean? You've seen a wormhole before? We've never seen a wormhole. Yeah, that's really weird because uh, Cooper, it was like, I guess he's an engineer. He's a, Is he an engineer? He's an ex-pilot. An ex I think he was an engineer and then a test pilot. Yeah. Yeah. And throughout the movie, his his like ability or like to comprehend space stuff it's totally all over the map. On the one hand, you have the scene you're describing where he's like instantly, is that a wormhole? That's a wormhole. <laughs> and then later on, being like, just, just asking questions just to dredge exposition for the audience. Just mm. asking like, how does this work to a, to a scientist? So they get to go, well, audience, this is how it works. Right, right, right. Yeah, I appreciated that though. I oh mean, yeah, you, you need definitely it. need that. Yeah. But I'm just saying from, on the one hand, this guy Coop can is, spot this. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of It's a little convenient. Wavering. Yeah. Um, did we get rid of MRI machines? Maybe they're wasteful in this new world. The magnetic rays are. This is one of the things that bothers me about this movie as well. Because, like, okay, we've all d established that we like this movie. So, like, we're just going to nitpick a little yep. bit. And that's fine. You know, you're allowed to do that. Yep. Uh, in this, like, world that has been ravaged by uh, blight on the crops and whatnot, it's like, what happened that got rid of all the MRI machines? I think it was just. Because they're like. We don't, there are no MRI machines anymore. We just have farmers. Wait, what? Yeah, I think that's actually one of the coolest things about this version of the future, mm -hmm. which is the fact that he's an engineer who's a farmer. Like, we all live with this assumption that technology and is going to keep progressing and that economies are going to keep growing. Mm. But in this future, it's like, not only did that stall, but it's regressed. This is like the first generation where it regressed and you have talented people who should be going into space, like Coop, who are just like, no, I have to grow corn. Yeah, I know that that I, I I tracked with all that. I think I was just kind of like, in what future would we think that MRI machines are not useful enough? And apparently, they don't have any sort of imaging technology. How are they doing medicine at all? Maybe they're just rare. <laughs> I don't know, man. Then yeah, maybe all the magnets died. The MRI machines left the planet along with all the rice. Well, maybe it's that uh, with all the gravitational disturbance that uh, Coop is doing, that magnets don't work quite right. So yeah, you know, he screwed it that's up. magnetic base. It's Cooper's fault. <laughs> yeah. We would have MRI machines if Coop didn't keep stealing them and pulling the electronics out. Yeah, I like geez. how they, when they're on Earth, they just use that single image of the, of that farmhouse and the cornfields to represent all mm. of everything bad that's happening on earth we never get montages of news reports yeah. we never get like a shot of the globe with like a virus spreading or any crap like that all you see is this these crops failing and dust blowing around which by the way nolan took careful attention to base that on things that have already happened mm. it's not even like future this could happen it's it's just from a ken burns documentary called the dust right. Bowl. all those uh, like what happened in the 20s all those or clips 30s. of the old people talking right no oh no no okay, no yeah 
I have two things. I love the state of the world, but I hate that framing device where they have like this documentary clips of people that are talking about what's about to happen in the movie. They're like, it's like as if there was a documentary filmed about the events that are about to take place. And they're talking about, oh yeah, the heroics that they did. Oh, this. And it's like the intro to a Ken's burn documentary. And that totally took me out of the movie for like a good 20 minutes. Why? What? How? It's, it's, it's right at the beginning though. Yeah. For, for like, but it's like cut over like it's five before minutes. Before you've gotten into the movie. No, it's like it's happening a few different times for about 10, 15 minutes. Ah. And I think it's such a mistake. Instead of like just grounding you in this world to try and put this like clever framing device that they'll ref- refer to at the end that doesn't really pay off. Like it's not that good of a moment when you get to his house and it's a museum and there's these screens where like, oh, I get I, now I understand why they had those documentary clips at the beginning. Instead, just have the farmhouse, have these st- beautiful, strong visuals, the dust blowing in. You've built right. this incredible world. Don't give me the stupid documentary like nonsense. Yeah. No, I feel I, like that totally took me out I of it. I think I track with you there. Uh, I think it doesn't bother me as much because it only... I think if he was going to do that, <clears throat> the way that he does it works really well where it mm. is only within like the first 10 to 15 minutes and then right. they're over. Um, but I think I agree with you that it's a bit tonally inconsistent where it's like, wait, is this like a documentary type thing we're watching or is it just like a narrative? But I do like how he... Constrains that to the beginning and then brings it back in the end. You're like, oh, yeah. it that's didn't what detract that was. for me at all. So I think the payoff at the end was cool. And there's a little layered payoff. Not only are you like, oh, they were talking about that time. Mm-hmm. It's also like, oh, that's that's Murph, yeah. right? Oh. One of the old ladies in the yeah. footage is is. Oh, Murph. is it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even yeah, pick yeah, up yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. That's sweet. Um, this is uh this this tendency of Nolan to ground you so hard that you don't get all of that extra information about like you know the news reports and everything is is a reason i like him and dislike him oh, interesting because sometimes it feels so claustrophobic as in like i want to know more like find a way to 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 give me more information without resorting to a super cheesy montage of like the alien invasion of 1978 and like archival news footage and like blah, 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 people are running into the hills. Just Oaksha bullshit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like those are obviously horrible. Everyone everyone hates those. But uh, find, find a medium in between there. And I guess this was, you could argue that the, uh, the well, documentary clips were sort of like a medium. They're kind of like that. But, and so is the interview with his son's teachers where they talk about how like, oh, we don't believe in science anymore. We believe right. they have this totally revisionist history kind of uh, view of the world they just changed yeah and they also the moon landings are fake yeah that was so funny the teacher is like um she believes the moon landings were real like well are you insane <laughs> i like that idea though that, that was great yeah I at loved some it. point someone decided that hope was no longer useful right that we had right. to get rid of this hope that we can move on and like we have to focus on like making us last as long as possible yeah. and i, I kind of like that bit of world building Another yeah. thing he does is when they're when they're chasing that drone out of the sky, mm. and you can see how important it is because they get that they get a flat tire, and then he asks his son to fix the flat tire. Then the drone goes by, and he's like, "We're gonna chase that with three tires. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to fix the flat." And they just go barreling into a cornfield when food is like such a scarce resource right. that it doesn't matter. Oh, the imagery, the stakes yeah. of getting that. I didn't drone. even think about that. Yeah. Power wow. the power the farm for ten years. Hands the uh, hands the wheel to his son, played by Timothy Chalamet, who is in everything. Okay, Timothy. Sh- I guess this is one of his first roles. This was 2014. Yeah, he maybe. was Before. he was he was a wee little boy. And I'll- everybody, just PSA from James once again. Timothy Sh- Timothy Chalamet is going to be in Dune. <laughs> uh, it's going to be Paul Atreides. Okay, just the God Emperor. Keep your pants on. Do you guys know that in the original script, that Indian drone was actually a Chinese drone? Weird. If the movie oh. came out this year, it'd be a Chinese drone again. Yeah. Question: What do you guys think about the robots? The robots are the, some of the sickest robots you've ever seen in film. Oh, are they? Oh, interesting. They're see, so cool. See, I, the first time I the first time I watched this movie, I think I was like, "Oh, cool! I've never seen that design of robot before." And now this time around, I'm like, "Those are dumb." Yeah, they like, don't seem practical. Like at all. I like they're so practical. They I, do tons of crap. Sure, but I I just mean the 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 we don't have MRI machines anymore, but we some, somehow designed these like perfectly dynamic all-purpose robots who can like reconfigure themselves to fit any scenario that's their main method of locomotion is just this big rectangle that splits itself in two and then like waddles around well the reason they're that's why their their backstory is that they're military 
It's like there may not be MRIs and other technologies for general use. Yeah. But there's like NASA still exists and they're still making cutting edge rockets. There are still pockets of I guess, civilization. I guess even the fact that they're military made me think that their design would be, I don't know, a little more look a little more utilitarian. They're completely utilitarian. No, no, I, I get the, the argument opposite. from a design aesthetic standpoint. Yes, it's just a block of metal. Yeah, it seems utilitarian. But like it doesn't when you look at it, it's like, what can that do? I want to see something that looks like a real object. This looks like this looks like Christopher Nolan took the monolith from 2001: A Space Odyssey and turned it into a robot. No, the the intention was I don't want an android. I don't want a human-looking robot. I want a, a completely functional robot. So this thing is just like a bunch of planks subdivided into smaller planks, and with all of those different little parts, can do lots totally. of different things. I think I was just kind of like, it seems a little too advanced like it's too original this design's too original i don't like it. it's gimmicky because it's so original i think it's it's yeah, just so far it's not from because it's the original. robots that we would build today yes, yes that it's a little unbelievable i didn't think yeah. i didn't believe that humans would build that yeah i got I, I i i believe that that could be like an alien robot yeah i i got the feeling that they wanted to make this a robot that didn't look like a human and they kind of were like what can we do practically and they came up with that for a practical design and then kind of like made it work in the script mm-hmm. i don't feel like the, I don't know. It, it, I don't think actually, from what I've seen of extra features, it was not that easy to manipulate around set and stuff like that. And also, <laughs> Riley, it r- doesn't look like something a human would design. It was literally designed by humans. In, yeah, in the movie. I'm in, just, in, it, in our world, it was designed, it came from a human's mind. Yeah, but he, by that <laughs> argument, humans design every alien thing that is in movies too. I'm just saying that like the, the aesthetic of it is not something that I would think that humans in the real world would believably design but it's so functional you could stack them you could ship them easily yeah i i guess i'm i don't think there there are design challenges in the in the in the structure of that thing that i feel like humans would not be able to to figure out well i'm sorry that you weren't like me who was basically like those look sick it's i love this i think it's the same thing it's the same thing as like the liquid metal terminators like i don't think we will ever invent something like that well those were invented by machines sure but i'm just saying in the same way that you look Skynet, at Skynet, Riley. In the same way that you look at those and you're like, okay, I don't think we'll ever get there. I think this is the kind of the same thing where I, I'm like, this it seems like too advanced. It's too which part of it? The, the weird. Form? It's like an the art form, project. The form factor or the like, the AI that it's the form factor on board. The AI is fine. The Although, AI is the most advanced thing about it. Uh, what? No, it's like A humor so, setting. We're like sliders. almost there now with like naturally speaking AIs, where like AIs can speak and sound like it's natural. Like Google, uh, what do you call it? duplex not even close this thing is like no. her, it's just like her level it's the same as in the movie her yeah, yeah yeah i'm just saying we're almost there we're not there but we're like google duplex sounds pretty good okay although on that on that subject the uh fact that they just like basically have human actors playing the ai roles with like no kind of robotic inflection also bothered me a little bit such a hater. And that's not because I don't think we could get there. That's just because I find it a little bit confusing when like a bunch of people are talking at once and then the AI chips in and you like for like I like I take a second to be like, wait, is that the AI? Oh, that is the AI. I wish that they made that a little more clear. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe if they had used a different voice, like yeah. if he had an accent or if it was a female voice, because there were fewer females on board than males, it would have been used. That, that would. That, yep. Something like that. Guys, can we talk about the worst scene in the movie? Okay. Subjectively. When, uh, no, this is objective. When Anne Hathaway she's tells weird people, in this movie. yeah, I don't think she's. This is her best what? movie. When she tells people that love transcends the love monologue. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> it's see, rough. See, I really like that part. Okay, so the setup is what? This is when they have a ch- a choice of which planet to go to. Yeah. They only have fuel to go to one planet. These two Earth-like planets are candidates for where they could add and even up and yeah. make more humans. One planet has a dude who turns out to be Matt Damon already <laughs> on it. That's what I did. I'm Space Matt Damon. Space Damon. He's already on it and sending data that looks decent. He's like, hey, come to my planet. It's yeah. not bad here. This planet's pretty decent. There's another planet with a dude on it named Edmonds. And his data looks better, but he hasn't been transmitting. Mm. Transmitting. He stopped. And so they're gonna have a vote: three people: Cooper, Matt, who's Matt Kahanake, <laughs> Matt Kagagane, and then Anne Hathaway, and then uh, the other guy whose name starts with an R. Romilly. They're gonna vote on which planet to go to. But then the cool Matt McConaughey is like, mm. "You're thinking with your head." I gotta be honest with you. Yeah. Something you gotta know. Uh, 
Anne Hathaway is in love with this Edmonds guy, so she obviously just wants to go there. Cue she, audience gas. She loves this guy. Then she goes into this monologue where she basically says, you know, I'm a scientist, but love is objective, it's observable, and it's the only thing that transcends dimensions oh, and time. And, like, we love people who are dead and, oh. and gravity goes through dimensions. And I so wish love. your face could be seen by the people listening to the audio only right now. Was it perfect? <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what bothers me most about that monologue is when... Uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey replies, "Is like no, like love is like a social utility. It, yeah. it binds us. It's yeah. for charity. It's Bonding. for this." Yeah. And she's like, "Well, then why do we love dead people?" It's like, and he's like, "He I can't immediately, look, yeah, he okay. can't immediately come up with a response." So it's like, "Yeah, I'm right." No, <laughs> no, that that's him just being like, "Okay, well, we're on this level, then." Why, yeah, 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 get out. Why here. dignify that? See, see now, okay. For when I first saw this movie, this I'm I'm really glad you brought this point up because I I wrote some notes about it. When I first saw this movie, I was like. This is kind of weird. Like, why did they make... Well, okay, it's weird altogether. The fact that they made a woman be the person to give this little speech about love. Because then it's like, all right, stereotypically, you're just thinking with your heart instead of your head. You know, the uh, classic woman character wants to do that or whatever. But seeing it the second time, no, having seen what happens at the end, I was kind of like, oh, this is the foreshadowing. And so then it had another whole... I appreciated it on another level because I was like, oh, this is the... This is why she's right. In the end, she's right. Edmund's planet is the right one to go to. But they had to go to the other place so that they could go to the black hole and have Matthew McConaughey talk to people in the past. Sure, sure, sure. So but like, I'm just saying that the force that she was feeling in this in this universe, yeah. in the interstellar universe, because I'm like, all right, this is not our reality because love is a fundamental force or whatever. It's not a fundamental force in our reality. But in the reality of interstellar, I was like, Okay, I can I I love this now because she's foreshadowing the fact that that is what this entire movie is about. So I in retrospect, I don't hate it actually. <clears throat> I do agree with you that especially on my first viewing, I was like this monologue is kind of weird. Yeah. It kind of stands yeah. out yeah. as being lame, but I think I, I remember I, like it now. I think I remember a lot of people hating that the first time that when the movie first came out, people were like, "All right, it's a really cool space movie. I wish that Christopher Nolan didn't like inject his weird stuff about magic love space stuff <laughs> into it." But other than that, it was a cool movie. Do you See, think Nolan injected that, or do you think it's like an executive kind of thing where they're like, "Okay, this movie's a little too spacey. It needs some human element." I yeah. think that's a Chris Nolan thing. I think like yeah. the adding the, of man in, in the later drafts and like having more humans as part of like the plot is what Nolan wanted to do. <sighs> I just. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. So it's, I, a, it's a movie that meticulously grounds you in this like pseudoscience of like, this is what going through space is like. This is what going through a wormhole is like. And it works so hard to be grounded. Mm. And for like such small chunks, it's like magic. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's why I liked this movie so much. And I think that's why I liked it a lot better the second time is because the first time through, I think it was just like con kind of confusing and I didn't really think about it that much. And the second time through, I'm like, Oh, this is like a really cool amalgamation of hard sci-fi because a lot of the stuff to do with like them being on the space uh, ship and, and how the orbital slingshots work and all that stuff and like having to match the spin so they could dock up perfectly. Hell yeah. Like that all cool. that hard sci-fi stuff is really cool. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, now we're going to take a movie about that and like inject this real human heart element in it mm -hmm. with like the love. And I'm like, I love it. Ah, ha, ha. That's why I like to say it's as good as a Hollywood movie can be. Mm. Hollywood. Right, it has right, right, to right. have all, all of those things. I mean, it does kind of suck that in order to ha inject that human heart into it, they have to like make up some stuff about love being a fundamental force. But who knows, you know, Maybe guys? It is. Nobody knows. But what do you know? She's just proposing this, though. Right. Right. And right. it kind of is internally consistent with the beginning of the movie where. Um, the gravity effects that later on we learn are caused by Coop when he's in the Tesseract. Later on, that was like immediately this ghost is obviously this guy traveling through time. I That was what? like when? not a surprise to me. What do you mean? When like at the beginning, all the gra gravitational anomalies that he's so like entranced in by. In the little girl's room and the books yeah. are falling yeah. off the shelf. Murph. Yeah, it's like I, I thought it was pretty clear that that was just like Murph some doing some time travel stuff. Wait, what? Communicating when with her. The, when you first saw the movie and the bits with the bo books falling off yeah. the shelf, you're like, oh, well, that's then, somebody coming no, back it's in when, time. No, it's when there's like, they're talking about a ghost and it's yeah. like, he's like, you got to take the facts, you got to take it observable, you got to do this. And it's like, there's just like so many scenes where they're like thinking about it. I'm like, obviously this is coming back and this is the only like explanation for like a loose thread that we need to finish. It's like, it's got to be him. Wait. Okay. Well, you're wait, big wait, brain. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big brain David over here. 
You're telling me that the first time you watched a movie. Yeah, yeah the only time. At only what point? You oh, just watched it, Oh, remember? you just watched it. This is the it. first time. So, so at what point in the movie were you like, oh, that ghost is Murph or Coop coming back in time to warn themselves about something? I can't remember exactly, but I think it's Can't like, remember when I became a genius. <laughs> I was born that way. Um, I think it was like 45 minutes in. It was like, because there's the, the different... How do you watch movies? Intently. In this uh, case, he actually just, started the movie at my place, and at about a, at that time or an hour in, they had to leave. And maybe that's part of it, is that I had, to, I had to pause oh. it, and so I was thinking about it. And then when I started again, there was like another clue or something. Oh. I'm not that smart. I watch a lot of movies. Okay, yeah, you're just as smart as the rest of us. Yes. Okay, maybe thank you. Our well. brains are all huge. <laughs> is, the room is full of brains. I would have figured it out, this too. This is actually maybe a, a good time to talk about the kind of weird time loop aspect of this movie, mm. like the causal loop that they're in. Um, is it a paradox or not? I think it is. It kind of doesn't make any sense. What do you mean? Well, just the fact that... like the, I don't think it's a paradox. Christopher Nolan movies usually have some kind of weird time element. In this movie, the story is told linearly. You're not jumping back like Tarantino style between yep. now it's the future, now it's... It's all linear, except the twist is that you find out this thing that they've been trying to discover, the they, the bulk beings, it's us. Mm. And like the ghost in the little girl's room... It was her own dad in the future, and he didn't know that yet. Yep. And so it's weird because the the path that this character goes on to like leave space and everything, leave Earth and go into space and everything is because of actions that he was the impetus for in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, but I don't. That's not a paradox. That's just a loop. A paradox is when you like break a loop. If like the grandfather paradox. It's, no, this is called the bootstrap paradox. It's a specific type of paradox. Explain. I have <laughs> the, the the events of this loop that they're in. It's like it's caused by him. And so there's no real be- discrete beginning or end. It's oh like, yeah. It oh goes okay. On so forever. the paradox is that like where when did it start? How, yeah. How could it loop? possibly have started? Yeah. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I saw I'm, one person. I'm on fine it. with the bootstrap paradox. I have problems with like if something changes and then it's like okay, do we start a new timeline? Is this the same timeline? It's clear to me that this is all one timeline mm-hmm. and that these uh, these temporal events just happened in a loop. It's weird, though, because even what you see in the movie isn't the whole loop because he his ghost like speaks to him, whatever. He leaves Earth. He saves the planet uh, by going to this Tesseract and interacting with the little girl who he give by interacting with her. He gives her data from inside a black hole. He <laughs> uses that data that is otherwise inaccessible on Earth to solve an equation that was never solved before. The solving of that equation allows them for some reason to uh, to like make bigger they figure ships. Out, they figure out gravity. So they figure out how to like manipulate gravity. It probably helps them get a ton of people off Earth that they wouldn't be able to yeah, do. I guess build the idea, stations that they wouldn't be able to build. There's a thing called the tyranny of the rocket equation where like the bigger your rocket is going to be, the more fuel it needs and it just becomes right. impractical. So, so they I learn guess how to manipulate gravity. If they wanted to launch a giant station with millions of people on it. Yeah. I mean, couldn't they just made a, a, like a station in low Earth orbit and then yes. ferried people or something? Well, anyway, maybe they did that. Yes. Who knows? They have to solve this equation. They need this data from inside the black hole to do that. He provides that to her. They get off, you know, they get off Earth. But even at the end of the movie, it's like, okay, civilization, now that we're off off of Earth mm-hmm. and we're galaxies away, let's remember for the next X thousands of years, once we finally become fifth dimensional beings, we got to build that Tesseract so that guy can go back in time. And, well, okay. Like, that's not so much a plot hole as it's just something we don't know. Like, I'm sure there's some reason they end up doing that. You know, well, I, uh, I don't th- look. Uh, never a, forget, we must whole, build this tesseract. <laughs> there's a whole set of in, uh, there's an infinite amount of questions you could ask about what happens after that point where like human between humans making it to space finally and becoming fifth dimensional beings. So I feel like the fact of like, wait, how do they know when to make the wormhole is like the least of my worries in that scenario. My big problem with that scene is okay so when he's trapped or when he's inside the tesseract he can interact with gravity inside of each of these kind of like scenarios with his daughter so he's communicating through the watch doing morse code and he like communicates like a life like a universe changing like mathematical (laughs) equation using morse code yeah morse code doesn't have like mathematical equations like it is not that complex like you're saying it doesn't have the greek alphabet in it yeah there's no symbols that doesn't have yeah a lot of the symbols like how do you do like division how do you do this like it, morse code is not complex enough to com- convey a mathematical yeah, equation also, and even if it was it would take like 35 <laughs> days to communi- like to convey this well like, he's in a tesseract 
Time is a uh, time is an illusion. She's, she's completely not. Outside she's, of. she's like, uh huh. Yeah. She's like growing old. That's... Well, but yeah, I mean, who knows how long it took her to to map out the you know translate it. Well, just because something is complex doesn't mean that it's verbose. Like e equals mc squared. Boom! I just Boom. said it. Boom! Got it. That's uh, you can extrapolate a but, lot from. But that he might formula. not know what m and c is. I mean, well, he probably would. <laughs> or she, Murph. I like how you oh. kept calling her little girl the whole time. <laughs> little girl. <laughs> also, I don't. Coop fully... kept coming back and talking to his little girl for some reason. <laughs> Maybe you guys can answer this. I don't fully get. At what point does he understand the formula? Like, is it just being inside the test rack? Do you like understand? Oh, he doesn't. No, he, he doesn't. never understands the formula no. he, because when Tars he... is relaying it to him and he's just translating into Morse code. So he's uh, he's McConaughey is Cooper is on the ship with Amelia Brand it's Anne, Anne Hathaway. He shoots himself into the black hole. He shoots himself in there with. No, no, Tars with the first. robot. No, the robot's on a Tars separate goes ship. First. There's yeah. two ships going to the black yeah. hole. And they're doing that to adjust their course so that she can f- land on the right planet because they've ran out of fuel. Yeah. It's weird because he's like sacrifices himself. He doesn't know what's going to happen in there. No. Nope. Why he does he do that? Uh, because he lied to Amelia Brand about how much weight they would have to lose in order for them to make it to Edmund's planet. Is his body weight really the determining factor here? You couldn't it's have not only his body weight, it's the ship, too. He'll just Lander lose one, the ship, dude. Lander one and Ranger one. Why don't they just launch the ship? Well, he's no, like 160 pounds. No, but but his deal is remember he's he's on this whole journey to save uh, his family on Earth. So if he makes it to Edmonds, okay, yeah, he might survive if they just get the ship, get rid of the ship, and he goes to Edmonds with Amelia Brand. But uh, if there's also a chance, he also kind of like thinks that he can save them by going into the black hole. But they already set that up because that's why they send TARS into the black hole so that maybe they'll right, be Right, but they don't range. know whether they don't know whether TARS can transmit the data. Yeah. So I think he, at that point he's just like, "All right, I don't really have much to live for if this doesn't work, so might as well just go for it." I think he's just a cowboy. Yeah. yeah. Matthew McConaughey. He just wants to oh, yeah. get it, man. Cuz that's another Gotta thing that kind of happens at the hole. end. Yeah. That's hmm? the, that's the thing Thank I like you, about Cyrus. black holes is I stay the same age and everyone else gets older at a rate of Here's 70 my. times. <laughs> There's so many like McConaughey moments where I just laughed out loud where he does that little like neck thing. You know, when he like in the, in the, um, you know, the Lincoln commercials that are yeah, so yeah. funny when he like leans back in his seat and he's got his hand in front of his face and he's like yeah, yeah. spinning a little imaginary ball in his fingers. And he's like, so much to think about. That's a lot of weight. That's a big bowl. <laughs> I didn't do to be cool. Okay. <laughs> I just lacked it. You know, my question, my uh, my plot hole question is: Darb, Were there more landers and and uh, rangers on the on the? Is, is it the endurance? Endurance. The endurance is the full space. Station I said thing. endurance earlier as like a joke, but you were But right. I forgot that's the actual name of the ship. Big brain, big brain Riley over here. The lander so, thing. Are you asking if that was on the endurance or if that's on man's planet? Because we saw a lander and we saw, they have two rangers and we saw one lander. Yeah. So I'm guessing they have another lander that she uses to actually land on Edmund's planet, but, but we didn't see it. No, because when, when you see endurance, you see it like fully specked out. It's that circular thing yeah. that creates gravity as it spins, Ease. and then the rangers go in the middle of it. There's no real spot for lander the one, on there. The one ranger goes in the middle. No, they t- two do, and they go like floor to floor. Oh, is that what it is? I think so. Mm. Oh. Okay, Guys. so where are the landers? Honestly, when the landers show up, when they when they get to man's planet, I think they're on man's planet. Like he used man. That's where land he landed with. That's what man used. No man's ship is on is landed. I don't know. Anyways, whatever. <laughs> landers come from. They have a lander machine. Land- you were saying that this is the best a Hollywood movie can be, and I agree. And I think one of the big failures of this movie for being a Hollywood movie is personifying the conflict in man. I think this movie mm. could have actually been like much more complex and like other real if they didn't personify uh, what they're going up against as Matt Damon. Mm. I think I really don't like that subplot of like, so they arrive on this planet, he's gone stir crazy and he's afraid of dying. So he sends these false signals to have people come rescue him. But then like all the things he does doesn't really make sense. Like why does he have to kill them? Why doesn't he just like say like, oh, my transmitter malfunctioned. Like, oh, I'm sorry, but like, I can join your crew now. Like, oh, I see there's an empty seat on your crew. Yeah. Like, why can't I just join you? It's not his goal to kill all of them. It's his goal to only kill Coop because Coop was going to go back to Earth and he was going to take the one ship. He's going to take a ship to do that. And man wanted the ship. Oh, really? Now, he, he does detonate. I did not pick up on that. He has a booby trap in his uh, a decommissioned robot named Kip. But that booby, he didn't set that off remotely in order to kill 
Romulus or <laughs> what the heck is that guy's name? Romilly. Romilly. He didn't do that on purpose. He just wanted to hide his shitty fake data yeah, that he was falsifying enough. and he booby trapped it for that. So right. he does end up like trying to and succeeding in killing two people. But no. I mean, I, I feel like it makes sense that he would not be thinking 100% logically if he, as you say, went a little stir crazy. Like, I feel like maybe it's a, la- are you saying it's a lazy storytelling technique? I just feel like there's a lot of spots where they could have like been like, all right, let's talk about this for a second. And like, didn't NASA plan for some of these astronauts to go crazy? Like, did they really think so optimistically about humans that like they would never turn and like never lie about these things? I don't think they, remember at the beginning well, of the movie, was- they talk about how the astronauts like haven't even been out of the simulator before. Yeah. I don't think they're the cream of the crop. They're kind of like, let's do what we can. No, and but also they talk man about, like, was the best of them. Yeah, he's the best of them. Yeah. But like, I don't know, man. Like, I, it just felt like it was like, something that scientists would have thought about like they they're thinking about sending a pair of people to mars think about the rigorous testing they're due to get like the right people make sure that their brains yeah. are in yeah the right but place. i'm saying is they don't have that luxury right <sighs> this is know. a desperation move i don't know and it also felt- how do you know they didn't have that kind of stuff i it mean like feels- they, they tell them they can go into hypersleep for a certain amount of time they probably have lots of entertainment available on board they got netflix dude yeah <laughs> they're good to go and interstellar is actually on their netflix <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah unlike just- ours well, just, it's a loop, so they would have the movie. Do you know that? Do you, do you guys hear that the Studio Ghibli movies are all coming to Netflix, but they're not, they're not can- in U.S. and Canada? Be, my guess is it'll be Disney Plus because Disney Plus isn't worldwide. That's some BS, <laughs> guys. Let's just take a moment, step away from Interstellar, <laughs> and talk about this. Okay, back. We're back. Okay, is Man's Planet too close to a black hole? No, it's the other one that's too close. No, no, no. I know that the other one is the Water Planet is the one that's stated as being too close to the black hole, and there's all sorts of time implications for that. But Man's Planet. They leave it and they're like, "Hey, we don't have enough fuel to get to uh, Edmonds' <laughs> place." I was gonna say Enderby, which is a small town in BC. <laughs> anyway, we can't get to Enderby. We can't float the channel. Okay, <laughs> how how far in advance do they know that the black hole planet, the one with all the water, is gonna be fucked? Like, do they do, does the does the woman know before going down and landing that she's like, oh, every hour here is going to be seven years yeah, back, don't, or back don't home. Don't they have scanners that can detect? Well, they like, knew that before they landed. Oh, then why doesn't she no, but know? Because it, it doesn't matter because time's relative. If the whole human race ends up living on that planet, then who cares? Like, this is just time to us. I know, but like for her, I think she was like, if I was her, land, like being like, this is my planet. I'm like, I have to land here. Ah, geez. <laughs> she goes down and tries to land and like immediately Just. gets crushed. It's like, I got the worst planet. You guys all had cool planets. I have a series of other questions I would like to pose to you guys. Please, we're running out of time. What's the, what's the stuff that hits the ship when he enters the black hole? He first gets in the black hole and it's just like cosmic stuff. I think it's dust. It's love. Okay, then his ship gets torn apart. Yeah, he's traveling through the singularity. Like as soon as his ship gets torn apart and he's just floating in his suit, his suit stays intact. No, no, no. His his ship didn't get torn apart. He ejected, which also doesn't make sense. But why did he have to do that? No, his ship does. It goes like behind him after he ejects and everything. Well, after he ejects, sure. But yeah, like his love was holding it part? together. Why was it going? Beep, 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 and you know what? The the part that actually bothered me about that scene was the fact that it's like, oh, losing power, blah blah blah. All the screens are shutting down, and then everything shuts down, and then like thirty seconds later, it's like eject, eject, and like the screens are all on again. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. Well, they're separate systems. <laughs> we okay. all have. How do they get him out of the black hole? This is a question I have also the, as the well. Alien, the future humans. No, just warp them out. They just warp them out? Yeah. Okay, so if they're able to like have a Tesseract in their time and like warp them out and do stuff, don't they have better ways of communicating than having him like go on this huge trip that like, maybe they don't go in the right order and maybe he doesn't have to go in the black hole? Like, is this really the best plan that these future aliens if have? If there was a better plan, there movie, wouldn't David. be a movie, David. It's a movie. No, why didn't they just appear to he us a good and say, point, "This is what you guys have to do." Here's the gravity equation. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> no, because we have to find it for ourselves. <laughs> you can't just be handed a wad of money and be like, "Now spend it wisely." You have to go through the the trials and tribulations sure. of learning the value of money so that you spend it wisely. One of the first cool, like, mind expanding moments in this movie is when they're going through that wormhole. They approach the wormhole, and it's so cool. Like to your point earlier, when you're like oh, yeah, I know they worked with scientists, and that's actually what it would look like. Yeah. That's what that wormhole would look like. It's I don't a know shiny the... sphere that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they go in, though. Once they go in, I don't know. Who knows what that looks like? But she sees this anomaly right. like just near her, 
and she reaches out to it and it starts like warping her hand. That was so badass. That was really cool. And in the end, when the Tesseract collapses on itself, uh, you see that it's um, McConaughey inside yeah. that looking back at her and he kind of reaches out to her. Yeah. But it's like, wait a second, because now the black hole Gargantua or whatever that he went into that singularity singularity collapsing is now spatially the same as this wormhole because no, no, no. there um the wormhole comes out by saturn and that's where he discover him so he the the aliens warped him back through the the wormhole this is what we have to assume it's like the bulk beings they like yeah. when they collapse the tesseract they just like connect them through that wormhole so it spits them out in the same place yeah that- it's all it's all magic okay. stuff man like yeah okay. at that point once once he goes into the black hole, and it's like I'm not. I haven't been torn apart by gravity. This is actually a fifth dimensional tesseract. It's like okay, now I'm now I'm forgiving any sort of logical yeah. leap and sort of how people got places or whatever. That's it's fair. Like, it's yeah. space magic at that yeah. point. So that's why yeah. he ends up at the hospital because he's just floating right where the all those ships would have been, just on the other side. Of, when yeah, he's floating where where the station is. They they yeah, set up the near station, Saturn. They leave Earth. They Cooper go Station. The, yeah, that's right. Named after me. Why does he write stay? In Morse code. That, yeah. When he knows that it didn't work. That's yep. the biggest problem. Yep. He's saying stay to himself. Like, tell him to stay, even though he knows exactly. He know, but yeah. the only explanation is that, you know, when he's talking to her and trying to like calm her down and she's freaking out about the fact that he's leaving, and she's like, do you know what it says? It says stay. And he's like, not even really listening to her yep. because he's like, it doesn't matter, Coop. It doesn't matter. Shut up. Like, listen to me. Uh, this is what you have to do. But he's not even listening. That's the only that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Is that so then he says, "Uh, tell him to stay because he doesn't know that that's what she Okay, said that to makes him. sense. Yeah. Okay, why is it when he's he it, when he's in the Tesseract and he's like screwing around with it, which is a really cool scene by the way, uh very emotional. He suddenly his radio like clips on and he's getting a transmission from Tars or Case. Is it Tars or Case? One of the robots. Wait, when? When he's in the test rack, it's Tars. It's Tars. Tars. Yeah, they Tars se- they sent the other robot also into the singularity, and they're in radio contact. And Tars is like explaining basically for the audience what's going on. Like, oh, you're doing this. You're interacting with the 3D world. <laughs> you're like, doing it, Cooper. How does that robot know what he's doing? You're interacting with time. Is yeah. Tars also in a different part of the test rack? Yeah. Tars is also interacting with himself in the past. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's how he's so advanced. He's like talking to an iPhone. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, Riley. <laughs> Humans didn't invent them. They invented themselves. Oh my gosh. That's why they're so advanced. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we I, figured it out. Yeah. Interstellar solved. If, okay, if these robots are so advanced that they're able to go inside of a black hole and like able to figure out what's going on, I think they're able to improvise. And that's the one line in the movie that they're like, that's why we couldn't send robots out to like do all this work robots. because they can't robots <laughs> robots <laughs> because they can't improvise. But it's like Tars is doing a pretty fucking good job improvising yeah. right now. He's got sucked into a black hole. He's in a tesseract. He's figuring it out and he's doing a good but job. I think, but, but I think he's also he knew that was his mission from the get go was to get inside there, get the data, and then all he's once he's in there, he just is like, oh, I can talk to Coop, and then he starts talking to Coop. Uh, we also have another scene where the robots are proved to be stupid because <laughs> uh, right after. Dr. Mann tries to dock onto the Endurance, and he fails. Uh, the Parts of the Endurance explode and everything, and then the Endurance is spinning really fast. Oh, that's so cool. It's such a sweet scene. Oh, I love and, it. And Coop's like, oh, I, can, I can dock to this thing. Yeah. And so, but here's why it's dumb. No. The robot is like, <laughs> the robot is like, it's impossible. And then Coop's like, it's not impossible. It's necessary. And it's like, oh, I don't okay. even remember that line. It's kind of a quirky, like a cheesy line, but it's also like, screw you, robot who can analyze things and make calculations on the fly. Well, it's not that, impossible. No, that's I'm classic. eyeballing it, and it's yeah. No, that's classic. So what, it's a goddamn robot. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's but not that, impossible because you say it's not. Well, the robot thinks it's impossible Maybe because it's, humans do things uh, not just based on facts and figures and calculations. We do things based on our gut, and so. Matthew McConaughey has that gut feeling that it's possible, and he's got the faith that he can do it, so then he just goes for it. <laughs> so I guess what you're saying is the robot, we know that the robot has all these different like meters that you can adjust for honesty and right. discretion and stuff, so maybe it has oh. a semantics meter where it's mm. like, I, what I really mean is this is very, very unlikely. Right. It's improbable that you'll be able to do this. Well, his honesty Somebody setting else. was at 90%. However, we he should know, he has already, already has a few data points about Cooper as a pilot. Cooper's already been slaying it. As yeah, a pilot yeah, yeah. In this movie. So but he, I don't. Th- but I don't think Tar's in a life and death situation is going to be like Cooper. You can probably do it. 
<laughs> you got this, dude. Oh, exactly. You got this, Slick. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I, um, yeah, I loved that scene. So awesome. Yeah. I also loved the uh, like the bro ship between uh, Tars and Coop. Yeah, how he like really doesn't like him in the beginning, and then by the end he's like, yeah, yeah, boot boot Tars back up, and he like brings him back up, and now he's his buddy. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, I like that. One little, of my favorite parts of the movie. That humor tone, that little yeah. like light that comes on. When yeah, that's so funny. The cue light. There's not a lot of uh, comic relief in this movie, but no, they got that going. Well, there's there's Christopher Nolan comic relief, which is like little bits of like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> there's not like ah, ha, ha, that's hilarious. It's yeah. more like uh-huh. oh, I think nice. it works though. And like this movie's three hours, but it doesn't feel slow. Like it's moving and there's stuff happening, and like I was entertained. It's not oh, a movie yeah. I'm gonna so, rush to watch again, but yeah. Me and David found out that this movie has really huge dynamic range in terms of the audio because mm. we were watching at my place and it was really late. And my baby was asleep and mm. I live in a loft. So There's like not even Jeez. doors between <laughs> oh rooms, right? With the organ, like so. Ring. I'm like turning it up to hear them talking, and then turning it way down when these like epic moments happen. Oh my god! But be- because I was turning it up and down and so much, I started to get this feeling of the rhythm of the movie, <laughs> and I was like, wow. There's these beats like every like seven oh, minutes no. it goes it just blasts us with this huge epic and if you climax. Convert the peaks and valleys into binary. It's love. It's the quantum. <laughs> <laughs> the quantum equivalent of love. Hey, I have some questions about the ending that we need to address. Okay? Yes, sir. Number one, do Cooper and Old Murph talk for long enough? Some people no. think that it was really like abrupt. Like, well, this whole story culminates. You're finally reunited, and you talk for like two minutes. I mm. love that scene. I really felt it because I was at that point in the movie. I was yelling at the TV. I was like, "Come on, man, give me something crazy!" And it it's like remains fully grounded, and then it comes back to like full reality, full right, basically right. Earth. So I was like mad. But then when they she actually sees him and he sees her, I really felt oh, it. Oh, totally. I was like, and she's like eighty. Get, yeah, I was like, this is a powerful moment. It's a good moment. Yeah, I loved but it. You're right. It is short, and like she immediately sends him off. Be like, go find that lady and yeah. make babies. Well, she's an old lady. Like what? Yeah. She she doesn't want to hang around with with. <laughs> I agree. With Cooper. I think she's yeah. like over it. She's eighty at this point. Yeah. She's had enough time. She's had to think about She would want to hear about his journey. Well, I think that I think that the whole reason he went on this journey is to allow her and humanity to have a life. And now that now she has she's had that life. It's over. Yeah. She's dying in bed. So she's like, you got stuff to do. Like you 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 still have your life to live. I would. So, I feel like she'd be like. What's it like to go through a wormhole inside a black hole? I think she's beyond that. She's, what, what she's an old see? lady. She, she's like wise now. She's like, I know. I don't think I, I don't need to know that. When I'm 80 and my dad has. Well, my dad's dead, but. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too, David. My but, Matthew McConaughey father. But the yeah. audience doesn't want to see that. Do we? No, it's just a bit silly. And it's just one of those things that's like, okay, it's a movie. Would you I, be happier if it was like a fade to black that implies that they talk for a long time? Maybe, yeah, something, a filmic device that allows you to, yeah, it's like they, they did talk. What he, about he the aspect? He could have done that. He could have done that. But yeah. what about the aspect that she's full of a room of her family? There's like 15 right. people it's in powerful. there. Right, and they no, don't, that kind of they've also, never met him before. Yeah. They're like, I guess he's our great grandpa. But I think the implication is that she wants to talk to them more. Yeah. Yeah. So well, no, no, no. It's not that she doesn't want to talk to him. I think she's just like, we don't need to talk. Like I got the quantum information. I don't need to get your firsthand experience of what it's like inside the black hole. I don't think she really cares about what it's like inside the black hole. She cares about family and love. And her arc is over because yeah. throughout the movie, her arc is like, did my dad leave me? Did he abandon us and leave us to die? And yeah. she knows the answer to that. Arc. And also from a storytelling yeah. perspective, again, I think it would just kind of be like, she's like, what was it like? And he's like, Oh, it was like, there were these weird specks of like love dust hitting the <laughs> ship. And, and we definitely yeah. don't need that scene, but yeah. Yeah. I also have a problem with how he's sent off to go and help um, uh, Amelia colonize this new Edmonds pro- planet. I have a problem with it because a, it's kind of weird. Like, why does he le- leave Cooper Station? Like, he's kind of everything he wants is there. I guess he just really loves adventure that much. He just wants to go out and get to the next oh, fight. Totally. Aren't, aren't they all going there? That's what I missed. Isn't the whole station going to her? No, th- that would make so much sense. But when he leaves, he like sneaks out. Yeah. He leaves at night, and then, well, because he th- he it would probably just be too. He steals the ship, but too then, much bureaucracy to like, like uh, you know, claim a ship for himself and stuff. They're probably like, no, we want to debrief you like for a million years and maybe. But yeah. aren't they sending like They're like an artifact of the past, an armada to like this is the planet? Like, wouldn't they be sending everybody? They'll there? get there eventually, but I think he was just like. 
They're like, hey, welcome back. Look, we recreated your house exactly as you liked it. And he's like, I hated this house. I hated the farm. Well, that's another thing. So he's like, I want to get out of here. How big is that spaceship that he's able to have like a full farm and a full farmhouse on? Yeah, you can kind of see the end of that. Oh, it's huge. Have you played Mass Effect? Yeah, but you don't have houses. You still have like apartments. Yeah, it's like the Citadel, though. Yeah, well, it's just a big I, I don't know. He's thing. like the emperor of it. Like, I think he gets he gets a little couple <laughs> He's acres the there. the emperor. People are living in broom closets. Emperor Coop, you have returned. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little spot of Calgary here for you to... They filmed it in Calgary. We have your 99 concubines. <laughs> <laughs> All virgins. So where where does this movie rate on your Chris Nolan scale? Oh, that's a Chris cool question. Chris Nolan scale. Okay, so you got <laughs> insomnia right up there at the top. Ew. <laughs> Just joking. So there's Insomnia, there's Memento, there's the Dark Knight trilogy, there's the Prestige, there's Inception, there's this, there's Dunkirk. I have not seen Insomnia or... I've seen like half of Memento and it didn't make any sense. (laughs) You have to see the second half to make sense of the first half. Yeah, that's the joke. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. (laughs) That's the joke. I know about about Memento. I just... uh, I lose that. Yeah. Uh, For me, it's... I don't know. I can't rate it, dude. You go. For me, it's like... Below Dunkirk, Dark Knight, and Memento is Interstellar, but it's above Batman Begins and Inception for me. What about Prestige? <laughs> That's below. I don't love the Man, Prestige. This reminds me of a Kill Bill <laughs> line where, where dude's like, you compare a Hattori Hanzo's sword to every sword in the world wasn't made by Hattori Hanzo. Is this, a re- is this an this Overwatch is a ki- reference? No, this is a Kill Bill reference. Uh, it's like, which N- Nolan movie is the best? Like, they're all no- you can't compare a Nolan movie to a Nolan movie. They're all sick. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. They're all really good. Yeah, I love uh, that quote. You lo- <laughs> We're doing Kill Bill at some point, man. <laughs> I've seen Kill Bill. I, I will do it again. Um, real quick, uh, the part where Murph lights uh, Tom's field on fire so she can, like, research in the room and stuff and then he comes back well she doesn't go to do that she goes to get the family and then gets distracted by her stuff well yeah, she the, came to the house initially to to go to the room and like figure it out yeah but i don't think topher grace would have let her drive back just to go and screw no, around they, her bedroom. she started the fire yeah, yeah i know that oh, oh after that she comes back to the house yeah yeah, yeah to, to get the family to out get the family and, out and to be a diversion so she can send spend a bunch of time yeah there. anyway she comes back out of the house and then tom comes up and she's like, oh, my gosh, I figured it out. Dad's alive. Oh, isn't it so great? And she hugs him. And, like, Casey Affleck is like, you just fucked my entire farm. Yeah. <laughs> you just destroyed yeah. all and my she's crops. She's just like, Eureka! <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's a great moment. And he's like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Yeah, I don't know. I uh, When Anyways. I first saw the movie and hated it, or didn't hate it, but when I liked it a lot less than my first watching years ago, that was the part that I didn't like. I was like, why is this guy such a dick? Like, <laughs> I get that he doesn't He's think- simple. He doesn't think that anyone's coming back to save Earth, so he's just trying to survive. But when they're like, hey, you guys like have cancer and stuff. You need to leave this house. Can he just be like, you're right. I'll commute to work. Like, I, I think he's just jaded. He's like, my, my, my baby died. My dad's dead. My sister left. We all have this lung disease. Everything sucks. So he's just like, he's, he's despondent. I love how he just punches Topher Grace <laughs> immediately. Topher Grace is made to be punched, though. Dude, Topher Grace is the most distracting actor. Yeah, yeah. I cannot, I, I can't just Came see him nowhere. be anything. He's either, he's just, that 70s show is slash Superman 3, Spider-Man 3. <laughs> Do you guys Venom. think this movie would be better served if there was a lot less celebrities in it? Do you think it was like no-name people? Instead of like, oh, I know him. Oh, I know him. Mm. Oh, I know him. It's a sick cast. It's a sick. I cast. think if I think if anyone is distracting, it's Matthew McConaughey, and and he knocked it out of the park in this he's movie. Great. So I yeah, I like I when he's watching the messages from Earth, and then it cuts back to him, and he's just sobbing. Yeah, yeah that was great. Great it's moment. A good scene. The, when when like they've been gone twenty three years or yeah. whatever. Yeah, there's a like, sick edit there too. Hmm. Uh, it's him watching the movie, watching the messages, and then uh, that sweet monologue from his daughter, being like, "It's my birthday, and you should come back because we're the same age." It cuts from there. To Earth, it cuts to the other side of that camera where she's there and she she's getting dressed after having done that uh, little web interview. Right, and it was just such oh, a sweet, yeah, that was sweet good. edit to bring us back. Oh, now that we're back a on great Earth. Transition. Yeah. The other sickest edit in that movie is when uh, uh, man is trying to dock and like, it, hold on. The other sick edit in that movie is when. That Matt Damon is on the endurance and he's like trying to get on there like don't open the airlock and he does and he's mid sentence and he just explodes just <laughs> screw whatever you're saying it's like this is uh, not for me it's for humanity <laughs> it was for you Matt Damon anyways Lloyd is uh, getting very upset he's loitering there. yeah alright it's time for us to get out of here guys if you like this show follow it if you're listening on Spotify right now and you're not actually subscribed you son of a bitch. do that now 
Uh, send us a message. You can hit us up on Twitter at Carpool Critics, or you can email us Carpool Critics Podcast at gmail.com. What a great email address. One of my favorites. Oh, well, that's the end. Okay, bye. <laughs>